Well, in the last talk, we heard about a historical perspective, and I'd like to begin with an evolutionary perspective. And from an evolutionary perspective, food is typically for humans either hard to get or hard to eat. We lack the strength and speed of the large carnivores or the specialized digestive tracts of the herbivores. And indeed, the diet of early hominids were highly, was highly limited, mostly fruits supplemented occasionally with seeds and insects. So for that reason, humans have, since the dawn of our civilization, sought to extend our diets, develop our diets through technology, technology to improve food amount, dependability, safety, digestibility, storage life, transportability, and taste. In this somewhat complicated slide, I've tried to, in a simplified fashion, overview a couple of million years of technological innovation. Uh, notice that the timeline is on a logarithmic axis, emphasizing the accelerating rate of progression. The, the first transformative food technology was, of course, the use of stone tools for hunting and food preparation, uh, and together with fire, characterized the Paleolithic period, which um, dominated human food culture for about 95% of our time as a species. About 12 or 14,000 years ago, domestication of grain and other plants and then animals led to the advent of agriculture. And then in the 1800s, as you heard in the last lecture, the mass production of white flour and sugar uh, set the stage for what I would call the commodity-based diet, characterized by food extrusion technology, petrochemicals, biotechnology, and the development of fast food. Each of these technological developments has had profound impact on human health and nutrition, with uh, use of stone tools and fire in the Paleolithic period, uh, our diet expanded uh, dramatically to include large animals, tubers, nuts, and other uh, new foods, which improved calorie and nutrient availability, caused us to spend less time acquiring and eating food, and decreased the demand on the human digestive tract. This led to the, arguably, the development of a smaller gut and a larger brain and evolution of modern homo sapiens with this new, richer diet. With the advent of agriculture, the diet became dominated by a few staple grain products. This led to a massive increase of calories, but a decrease in nutrient density. Grains have a relatively low concentration of nutrients relative to their calories. This, in turn, caused a massive expansion of human populations, development of civilization and culture, but also, for the first time, endemic protein and micronutrient deficiency diseases, especially with grain refinement. In fact, there's, agriculture, there's evidence archaeologically that height of humans decreased with transition from hunter-gatherer to an agrarian lifestyle. That height has only recently been uh, reclaimed in Western countries. In the commodity-based era, uh, diet has become dependent upon massively processed foods. This has caused further decreases in the cost of food. Uh, so for example, at minimum wage, uh, in one hour, a worker could earn enough money to buy a full day's calorie requirements from fast food. Um, this has also further decreased the time spent, time spent in food preparation and cooking. But it's had major implications to human health um, and nutrition. Traditionally, meals were prepared in the home from minimally processed ingredients. Today, meals often consist of ultra-processed products prepared outside of the home. This uh, mess with the mouth tacos, clearly advertised to children, consists of these concoctions and pastes that you get out of that package. These ultra-processed foods are designed to resemble traditional foods, but in fact represent a, radical, a radically different product. For example, strawberry fruit, fruit gushers sound and look a little bit like strawberries, but they only contain a trace of 
strawberries, presumably for advertising purposes. In fact, they actually consist of a long list of artificial ingredient, of, of ingredients, some artificial, others highly processed, that have never, never before been in the food supply. In fact, ultra-processed products are made by extreme chemical and mechanical manipulation, primarily of three commodities, corn, wheat, and soy, and the animals that are raised on these. But they're marketed in enormous variety. Whereas traditional diets were com composed of a variety of fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, different grains, animal products, but marketed in limited form. So we've gone from species diversity to product diversity. In an interesting anecdotal report, Sanjay Gupta of CNN did an isotopic analysis of his hair and found that 69% of the carbon in his body was derived from one species, corn. Uh, there's extensive literature showing how the ultimate manifestation of this dietary pattern, fast food, affects uh, children and adults' eating habits, leading to gorging, leading to a positive calorie balance through the day, and ultimately weight gain and increased risk for diabetes with increased consumption. Ultra-processed products have their negative effects not because of any one dietary principle, but because they contain the worst aspects of virtually every dietary principle. High energy density, enormous portion sizes, low nutrients and fiber content, poor quality of dietary fat, what I would ter term primordial palatability, and lastly, high glycemic load. Let's start with energy density. You could have a bowl of strawberries, eight ounces, 200, about 280 grams, to get 90 calories. Or you could have one ounce of fruit gushers. We know that, at least acutely, individuals regulate food intake by volume more so than calories. Chronically, energy density is associated with nutritional quality, body weight, and diabetes. And related to this is portion sizes, which of course have gone up dramatically in recent years, um, driven by the extremely low cost of the commodities in these, portion, in these uh, uh, processed foods. You could buy a gulp at 150 calories or a double gulp at 600 calories for a difference in 37, uh, 37 cents. Young children seem to adjust their food intake regardless of how much is served to them, whereas older children eat more when given larger portion sizes. We may learn to disregard endogenous satiety mechanisms in a culture of highly processed foods. While ultra-processed foods are high in calories, they're devoid of true nutrition. Um, in that bowl of strawberries, with those 90 calories come five grams of fiber, many vitamins and minerals in physiologically relevant amounts, and dozens or hundreds of micronutrients and phytochemicals that protect the body. The fruit gushers for those same 90 calories give you zero fiber and virtually no nutrients or protective plant substances. We know that fiber has a modest effect independently on body weight, but a major effect on risk for chronic disease such as heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Micronutrients and phytochemicals, the substances that give plants their color and taste, decrease oxidative stress and inflammation, reduce in insulin resistance, and again, act synergistically to protect against chronic disease differently than can be obtained by taking isolated vitamins. Ultra-processed products depend upon fats that are solid at room temperature for product stability and have traditionally included high amounts of trans and saturated fats, whereas very little polyunsaturated fats, which would be either destroyed um, in product preparation or eliminated uh, because they tend to go rancid. Monkeys given energy controlled diets with trans fatty acids develop abdominal obesity and insulin resistance compared to the more natural cis fatty acids. Humans fed polyunsaturated fat for 12 weeks 
improve their adiposity and improve their metabolic state. Primordi primordial palatability refers to the innate preference for the primary flavors of breast milk, sweet, salt, and fat. And these flavors are intensively present in ultra-processed products, and they're further enhanced through chemical manipulation. Um, in a, an interesting study of rats, given the mutually exclusive choice between either saccharin, an artificial sweetener, or intravenous cocaine, most of them seem to prefer the saccharin, suggesting the addictive nature of these products. And then lastly, I'd like to comment on the rate of nutrient absorption. Traditionally processed or minimally processed foods are absorbed slowly throughout the entire digestive tract and cause high levels of satiety, whereas ultra-processed products are absorbed in the first few inches, literally, of the small intestines, leading to a surge and then a crash in blood sugar. Um, that is characterized by the nutritional concept of glycemic index, white bread, white rice, certainly sugar, but all processed carbohydrates tend to have a very high glycemic impact, whereas unprocessed fruits, vegetables, legumes have a much more gentle impact on blood, on blood sugar. When we gave subjects instant oatmeal versus traditionally processed old-fashioned oatmeal for a vegetable omelet, we found that controlling for calories, food intake after those test meals was substantially higher, six or 700 calories higher after the instant oatmeal, which is a, an ultra-processed product. Over the long term, glycemic load has a major impact on risk for cardiovascular disease. In this study from the Nurses Health Study, a double, doubling of the risk of having a heart attack in the highest versus lowest categories of glycemic load. So we have a, an obesity epidemic that has been summarized in previous talks today, which is arguably primarily attributed to diet and importantly to food processing. We have predicted that this epidemic will decrease life expectancy by two to five years or more by mid-century unless something is done about obesity. The total economic costs of obesity have now reached about $300 billion a year. By 2020, at least half of the US adult population will have diabetes or pre-diabetes with estimated costs of half a trillion dollars over a decade. By 2030, the total economic costs of heart disease are predicted to exceed $1 trillion. Now, we're talking about numbers that could allow the Democrats to have their social spending, the Republicans to have their balanced budget, and for all of us to be happy together. As Dr. Willett had um, emphasized, a prudent lifestyle can virtually completely protect against heart disease and diabetes. And these are very simple principles. Avoidance of smoking, moderate light to moderate alcohol intake, moderate physical activity. But with regard to food processing, these components of a healthful diet and their impacts of body weight are all affected by technology, cereal fiber, polyunsaturated fats, trans fat, glycemic load. These are the principles we previously considered. So the question is, how do we go from our ultra-processed, chronic disease-promoting diet to a healthier lifestyle, a healthier diet? This does not suggest that we're going to go back to the farm and grow our own food, nor do we have to get rid of food technology entirely. In fact, some of the elements of a traditional diet, the white bread, the cheese, even the olive oil, involved processing. So the question is really, how do we use processing in a more sensible way to promote health, rather than industrial profits? And I have a few suggestions. Beginning with government, restructure agricultural subsidies to promote public health over special interests specifically promoting fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole foods. 
regulate food advertising and marketing, especially to children, and adequately fund school lunch and related nutritional programs so they don't have to become dumping grounds for fast food. Public can buy fewer ultra-processed foods and prepare meals, more meals at home from basic ingredients. Schools can prepare lunch and snack foods from whole ingredients and institute a new home economics curriculum to teach this generation of children how to cook again. Restaurants can provide intermediate options between you know, a five-course gourmet French meal on the one hand and fast food on the other. So convenient, inexpensive meals prepared from whole foods. Chipotle, Chipotle restaurants, for example, is uh, exploring this paradigm. And the industry can use higher nutritional value ingredients versus commodities. It can market minimally processed or traditionally processed products such as stone ground breads, steel cut oats, and the like, and use preservation techniques that preserve polyunsaturated fats rather than converting them into trans fats. In closing, I'd like to share a thought from George Stewart, uh, published in Food Technology half century ago. He said, if we do not pay proper attention to the nutritional pro problems associated with food technology, we run the risk of eventually producing an abundance of palatable, convenient, stable foods that are not capable of meeting man's nutritional needs. In other words, we run, run the risk of undermining the nutritional well-being of our nation. It is my contention that every food technologist has a moral responsibility to help provide the public with nutritious, not just palatable foods. Thank you for your attention.